tell us a little bit about what happened with your shoulder and how did you end up like this? Were you born that way? Did it happen sometime in your life? Like, what's the story behind it? Sure. Even though the military tried to convince everybody that I lost my shoulder as a small child, <laughs> which is, I could have never joined the military without a shoulder. So what happened was, in about 2000, the year 2000, I saw a lump growing under my arm where I felt it. And it, was a, it, it just kept growing and getting bigger. So I thought, well, maybe it's the pull-ups I'm doing. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe I pull the muscle and it's swollen and it'll go away in time. But I went to a doctor after it didn't go away and he sent me to a place and I got an ultrasound. And they said, go home. This was right before Christmas too. They said, go home and enjoy Christmas and we'll give you a call, you know, when we figure out what it is. So I went home. I didn't enjoy Christmas much because I was worried about what the results would be. And so I get a call after Christmas and I'm told, you need to go report to a cancer center in Abilene, Texas and see Dr. Heaven. And I said, Dr. Heaven? Couldn't you pick another name than Heaven? I said, I want to go to Heaven, but not right now, you know. So I had to go see Dr. Heaven. And when I got to him, he said, you have a malignant tumor under your right arm. It was in my latissimus dorsi, my, my right wing. And we're gonna just try to remove the tumor and let you go on about your life. Hopefully it won't come back. It was a type of tumor that doesn't typically spread through your lymphatic system. It's localized and it eats up muscles and bones, whatever it touches. So I said, okay, so I had the surgery. I got out of surgery and they had, they had had to remove two thirds of my right shoulder blade, but they left my entire shoulder intact and they removed my wing muscle. Well, I had been in the Marines, we did a lot of pull-ups, but at this time I was in the Army, and Iraqi Freedom, the buildings had been hit, and I told my doctor after I got out of surgery, I said, doctor, this is not good because I've got a war to go fight. And he said, you're not going to fight any war. We just gave you surgery for cancer. There's no way you're going to Iraq or Afghanistan. I said, yes, I am. He said, no way, you can't. So the Army gave me a physical fitness test to see if I was physically fit enough to go to war. So I passed the test and I went to war. So, but while I was in Iraq, I, I made it nine months before I was in a Humvee accident chasing after some insurgents and it crushed what shoulder I had left. So they met a back to Germany and then to Walter Reed in Washington where they found that the tumor was, had come back. But this time it was like a pancake with fingers and the fingers grew into my chest and they grew into my, into my back. So I had to have another surgery. They removed the tumor, but this time it took about 12, 13 hours. The doctors had to literally peel the fingers off of my ribs and muscles and everything. And at this point, because the shoulder was crushed, they went ahead and removed all of the shoulder. There's no joint, there's no collarbone. They removed the rest of my shoulder blade and they removed my trapezius muscle up here coming from the neck. Uh, they removed all the muscles along my ribs and they scraped my ribs real good. And then they, they said, this time we're gonna do radiation because last time we cut it out hoping we got it. But this time we're gonna make sure that we kill anything that might still be left. So that's what I did. I went through six weeks of radiation therapy and it, it fried me really good. I mean, it looked like the worst sunburn you can imagine under my arm and on my back. And they wired my arm to the stump of my collarbone right here the first time. But after about a year, the wire broke and so they screwed it on with nine screws and a titanium plate. After about a year, my daughters taught me into going water skiing with them, and I couldn't ski with both arms, but 
there was that thing for, it was Operation Purple for military families. Well, everybody is trying to create courage and, you know, slide down this thing, climb up that thing. Well, I said, I don't think that's a good idea because I'm screwed together. <laughs> and my kids, they were in elementary, two of them, I have four daughters, but these two are still at home. They said, Dad, you can do it. You can do it. It'll be okay. So I opted for the knee board option. They strapped my knees to this board. And I told the instructors, I said, my arm's wired on. I can't let it get in the water. So she said, no problem. We'll just stick it in your life vest. And that'll hold your arm and you can ski, fall onto the rope with this one. And I said, no, okay. I really didn't want to do it, but my kids were looking at me like, Dad, come on now. Don't, don't do it. Care. Yeah, you can do this. So we were going along, and we hit a bump, and my arm flew out of the life jacket, hit the water, and it ripped it back like that. And the screws that were holding my arm on popped out up here. I had nine screws, and these four popped out. So I had to be rushed to surgery, and they took all the hardware out. And they took bone from my hip, and they fused my arm back on. But it was just fused. It was just frozen like this. I could move it from the elbow down. It's just frozen, so I walked around like this. I'm like, I still walk around like this. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I think about a little over a year ago, I was working on my motorcycle. And I'm not supposed to ride a motorcycle anyway, but I was working on it. You can do it. I can do it, yeah. I can do, it. I can do all things through Christ's strength. And Google to help me fix the bike when it breaks. But, so, I had the bike up on a two by four to make it level so I could change the primary oil, built some oil, had to be level. Well, the bike started falling and, I, and it weighs 900 pounds so I tried to grab it with both arms, not thinking, it's just a reaction and it pulled this arm so hard it broke this little stump of a collarbone, it broke it in half and the arm fell off. So it was just hanging like that. So. After being chewed out by my wife severely, you know, I mean, she took me to Brook Army Medical Center, which I was just released from June 22nd. So when I got there, they had said they were going to take a bone out of my lower leg and and make a, face, a, a new collarbone and hang my arm back up. But the vascular doctor said all the radiation destroyed the veins in your shoulder that would feed the new bone because if they put a bone up here, they have to plug veins into it to keep it alive or it would die. So that's what I thought I was gonna get, but I didn't get that. And they said, you'll never ride your motorcycle again. If we fuse this on, or put this on, you're never riding again. And I'm like, Lord, please help them not to be able to fix this. You know, so, but I reported for surgery. Had surgery at 0600 the next morning. But my doctor said, that's when they broke the knees that they couldn't fix it. And I said, thank you, God, I appreciate that. So I thought things were going to be good. But they said, no, we're going to cut your arm off. We're going to amputate it in the morning at 6. I said, uh, no, no, I don't think so. Looked at my wife, she said, no. So thanks to my wife, she talked the doctors in to send me to this. This is called the Center for the Intrepid. It's a Brook Army Medical Center, San Antonio. And the building is dedicated to nothing but building prosthetic arms, legs, and body parts for soldiers who are injured in Iraq, Afghanistan, or whatever. This is the top-notch place on the planet because they had a lot of people to work on. Sorry I'm taking so much time. <laughs> but so that's where they let us go. So instead of going to get my arm cut off, we went to see this guy, prosthetic guy. I can't say the real word. Lord, a beautician. We went and saw the beautician this morning. <laughs> that guy. And my wife said, hey, for 12 years I've been dealing with this man. He don't listen to me. He's always breaking stuff on his body. And she said, but I've been planning for this. I used to make wedding dresses for a living. She did not. Uh, and she said, I have designed it, Ray. has been designing it for 12 years. And not only will it hold his arm on and protect his body, where he has no muscles, but just ribs, so if he bumps something, if somebody goes, hey, hey, you know, you know, so it won't hurt him. And the prosthetic guy said, hey, yeah, why don't we just give him something off the shelf made out of neoprene and belt and all that? My wife said, no, 
no, that's what everybody does. They just give us that off-the-shelf stuff and it don't work. He said, but neither does the designs that my patients bring. He said, they never work. Why should I listen to you? She said, because I designed wedding dress. What dress, what part did you not get? You don't believe me? You need to try it. He said, okay, I'll try it. So they gave me a cast. And instead of building it my wife's way, he built it his way. It didn't work. So my wife has gone, I told you. So anyway, they had to rebuild it. And this is my wife's design. Amen. And so it serves more than one function. For one thing, my arm is not attached. They could not reattach my arm. It was amputation or just brace. There's only two options. The good thing is, they said since they didn't fuse me back together, I can still ride my motorcycle because there's nothing to break. How can you break something that's not there? <laughs> so thank you God for the miracle that I didn't get my arm cut off. I can still ride my motorcycle and, and now I can function. I can lift stuff where I couldn't before with the screw together. I can lift most anything on this stage with this one arm because the brace keeps it from pulling my arm off. And, and this brace acts as a shoulder so I can, you know, it just, it helps me. What have you, um, I know you guys do a lot of work with people that are going through all different types of situations and stuff. Yes, sir. I'm sure that you guys probably prayed when you had the tumor and when you had the arm situation, God fixed this, healed this. That didn't happen, nor where you are. Right. How has that experience helped you when you're dealing with people that are going through difficult circumstances and, and the type of people that God's ended up connecting you with? How has this helped you in that ministry? God has made me a very busy man because of this. Uh, and you're right. When I first I got cancer, I was like, why me? You know, what's going on, God? And I grew up in an assembly of God church. And I, I, I had a drug problem when I was little. My mom drugged me to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Sunday night. Everything that happened, I, I drugged the church. So I had a drug problem all my life throughout the church. But so we had people running up down the aisles, you know, with their arms raised, speaking in different tongues, and and you tell them that they can't fix something, God can't fix something. They'll they'll give you a walk for I tell you what. They, so I grew up in a church that said, you know what? I know you have cancer, but God's gonna heal it. So never in my wildest dreams did I think that I wouldn't be healed. Even though the doctor said you got about 10 years left. That's usually the natural progression for what you got. You got about 10 years left, but if it don't come back, but it came back. So I was looking at him like, yeah, okay, whatever. I, I'm not dying. I'm going to war. I'm not dying. I mean, I walk by faith and not by sight. I walk by faith and not what I see. I walk by faith and not by what people tell me. I don't care what they tell me. I, I don't take negativity. And so, what I did was, I went home after I found out I had cancer. And I was in Abilene, Texas. I got a phone book, it was about that big. I looked in the yellow pages under churches. I knew the only help that I had, the only chance that I had was through God. And I knew that if I prayed just by myself, if my wife and I just prayed by ourselves, if my wife and my immediate family prayed, God would hear it because one cord is easily broken, three are hard to break, or two or more are gathered, Jesus is in the midst. But I took this theory, or not theory, I took this fact, I believe this fact, and I said, well, if, if three people, Jesus is in our midst, and a three, three folded cord is not easily broken, I got the yellow pages. Yeah. I called <laughs> every church in the yellow pages, and I said, you don't know me, my name is Jason Castile, I have cancer. And they said I have 10 years to live. I don't believe it. But I need you to put me on your prayer list if you don't mind. No, okay. What you need to do? And they put me. So I, I went through every church in the phone book. And so I got all these people praying. And not only did what the tumor was removed, and the doctor said I couldn't go to war, but I went to war. And I even got to fight hand to hand. Because that was one of their concerns is Hey, if you had to protect your teammates, could you do it? Well, I was put to the test. We waded into a Civil War type thing between two different factions. And my major, I call him Custer, because 
We only had five people, and there were hundreds of them. He told them, let's go break it up. I'm like, no, that's crazy. We did. So I had to fight this guy with him. He had an ax. I didn't shoot him because if I had shot him, then we'd have 300 people that would have, would have torn us apart. I was trying to keep the peace. So I didn't shoot him. I just put him on the ground and put my rifle in his face. I told him in good old American English that if he didn't stop, and I can't say that in church. <laughs> anyway, so I went to God. And I always say when I preach that I always mention Revelation 12, 11, and we over, or they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. We overcome the devil, we overcome sickness, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus, and the word of our testimony. So it has helped me to go through what I've gone through because not only can I work with people in oncology that are facing cancer, I can work with soldiers, and that's what I do. Uh, my wife and I have a counseling business in Austin, but I, we don't charge soldiers. I help soldiers with PTSD, and uh, because a lot of times a soldier won't talk to anybody else except another soldier who's been there. You know, they don't want to go to a psychiatrist who says, "Oh, I understand how you feel," and they'll black tell you, "No, you don't understand." You don't understand what I've gone through. But they, I can relate to them. They can relate to me. So God has, like I said, he's put me to some serious work. And he's allowed me to minister to so many people. When I was in the hospital for several months at Brook Army, they made me their pastor every Sunday morning. We had church service. So I got my guitar, which I'm not supposed to be able to play because of the shoulder. Uh, I strapped it, got my arm over, and we sang and praised God every Sunday morning. Had Bible study every Tuesday night, and we had many, many people with leukemia there. And, and one, one lady had been shot in the head, but she was blind. Had a lot of people to minister to, but God used me. I used to be in that hospital, and I wasn't a minister. I didn't have my degree. I didn't have anything except a really bad shoulder problem, fighting cancer sitting in a room as an outpatient, going back and forth to the hospital. I chose that time. I said, God, let me just use this time. I'm sitting here for three years to study your word, to learn everything I can so that I can, so I can share your word with other people. And that's what I started doing. But he didn't heal me. Back to the assembly of God, he healed me, but not the way I thought. The assembly of God, in my mindset, was and he can, I believe this with all my heart. God can build me a brand new shoulder. I have no doubt that he can make it up here. But as honorary as I am, and as wild as I was, if he put me a brand new shoulder on, I'd probably just get on my bike and wind up in some bar somewhere. You know what I mean? But God said, no, no, I know you. I know you. I need, I need your arm to stay like this because... As long as this is here, it reminds you that that you're mine. And you can still ride your motorcycle because God can make a way where there seems to be no one. Amen. You can still ride your motorcycle. You still have your hand. You can still play the guitar. And you still have your big mouth so you can preach. <laughs> so if he would have healed me like an assembly of God healed me, I would, probably would, I would not be standing here today talking to you and, and you great folks. Uh, so sometimes, see God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Yeah. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knew us before we were ever born. He already had a plan for us while we were still in our mommy's womb, tummy, you know. And he knew exactly who we would be. And he had, and we, we are all called. And if we just let God use us, and not think about what we've lost, but think about the good. See, God takes what the devil intended for bad and he uses it for good. Every time the devil tries to throw something in our way, God says, all right, I'm just going to make you look silly. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it benefit them. I'm going to make their enemies their footstool. I'm going to make them above and not beneath the head and not the tail. 
um, bless them coming in and going out. Goodness and mercy will follow them all the days of their life. And no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Because in the end, God will work it out for you. No matter what you're going through, like Crystal said, he works all things together for the good. Anyway, that, that's yeah. my Awesome. Story. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. So, I mean, that's a great message and a great story because that is the reality of what God wants to do, not just for Jason, but for all of us. God wants to take certain circumstances, like he said, you know, you pray, they believe, you have people around them believe God can make a new shoulder, this can all be better. But had God done that, he wouldn't be where he's at today. He wouldn't have had that time in the hospital pastoring people that needed it. He wouldn't have had that time with veterans that are going through different things. And they see his shoulders and man, you've been where I've been. And all the things that God is doing out of it wouldn't be happening if he had just been prayed for a new shoulder, everything's fine. And so sometimes God's doing something through a circumstance that we are in. And we get frustrated, discouraged, you know, we start to lose our faith. We're like, God, why aren't you changing this? That could be a financial thing, that could be a physical thing, that could be a relational issue that we're going through. It could be any of those things, and we get stressed out about, well, where's God? And God knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly what I need. And he doesn't change those things sometimes because he wants them to be there. I'm going to read a scripture. This is out of um, John 9, 1 to 3, and this is in your notes. But it says, it's talking about a blind man that's by the road, and it said, as he passed by, this is Jesus, he saw a blind man from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, the man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, and he said, it was not that this man sinned or that his parents sinned, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So one thing that happens when we're going through a tough circumstance is we get really caught up in this idea of, what did I do wrong? What did I do to cause this? What could I have done differently? How did I screw things up? And we start to get really beat up and discouraged on that. And that could be anything. Again, relational, financial, parenting. It could be a kid at school. It could be anything that's going on in your life, even a health thing. How did I wind up here? What could I have done? And we get caught up in this and we just get tangled in it. It just keeps us spiraling and spiraling and spiraling. It keeps us from lifting our eyes up and looking around and saying, what could happen here that's good that God wants to do? Because it's not necessarily us or something that we've done wrong or something that somebody around us has done wrong that puts us in our situation. Sometimes God puts us in a situation not because we're in trouble, not because he doesn't think that we're doing good, but because he believes that we can do something good in that situation. And that situation will help to magnify and bring peace to others and bring his word to others and bring a revelation of who he is to the people that are around us. And so they'll put us there. Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9 says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. So something negative that's in his life going on, so in his flesh, whether that's physical or whether that's in the flesh as in just in the natural, we don't know, but we know that something was after him, something bothered him. And it says that he prayed for this, and he asked the Lord to take it from him, but God said no to me. My grace is sufficient for you, for your power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that God's power might rest on me. And so even some of the ladies that came up and shared were sharing about being in a weak place, and yet God's using it for good, God's using it for his glory. And so that's something that happens. Whatever your scenario is, if you can say, you know what, this is my broken spot. You know, I love that Susan came up and shared. She's like, I don't want to share, but I'm sharing I'm not feeling like very good, but I'm sharing. Why? Because we're just being real. We're saying, you know what? This is me. And God used me two weeks ago when I felt like I was the queen. Everything was amazing. And I was the best. And I should be a counselor. And I should teach everybody stuff because I got it figured out. And now today when I feel like everything's a mess, and I don't know what I'm doing, God can still use me. Why? Because it's he who is in you that is greater than he that's in the world. Right? Not us, but him. And he can work through us at every moment, at every time, whether we're doing perfectly or not. Another scripture that's in uh, your books, and this is a longer one, we're going to read through it. This is 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 18. It says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay, talking about God and who he is and his goodness, his message of the gospel. 
is to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. How can I share about God? Look at me. Look at my mistakes. Look what I'm going through. Look at my challenges. Look at the hardness of what's happening. How can I share about God? I don't have it all together yet. I got things going on in my marriage. I got things going on in my family. I got things going on at work. I got things going on in my head. I got things going on in my body. How can God be with me? Or how can God be working in my life? And it starts to push us away from being used or being affected by God to impact others. And it says in verse 8, it says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, which is confusion. I'm confused. Why is this happening? Why is this going on? So confused, but not driven to despair. There's a difference. I'm confused, I'm perplexed, I'm going through a hard time, but I'm not driven to despair like people who don't have God. Because my strength, my confidence has never been in the circumstance. It's always been in God. And if I'm going through this circumstance with God, then I can trust that he has something good that he's trying to work out through it. Something's coming out of this that's good. You know, my mom passed away uh, several years ago. And there's a, a sudden a brain aneurysm, and she was gone. And there's not really anything good that would come out of, you know, losing your mom when she's in her 50s, and the kids losing grandma, Nana, who calls her. There's nothing good come out of that. But what has now, looking at years that have passed, has come out of that that's good, is that my mom uh, leaving caused different situations to unfold where two of the brothers and sisters that I had still living at home got drastic, life-changing help that they desperately needed, that my mom was not able to provide. One of them uh, had an eating disorder, had been hospitalized, almost died, she could never have babies, she was, had all kinds of mental and emotional things going on. And my mom loved her, my mom helped her, she cleaned to my mom, but my mom couldn't help her. My mom being gone brought someone else into the situation with a completely different personality, a completely different way of doing things, more of a drill sergeant type of a person <laughs> that eventually caused enough friction that my sister left, moved out, but she was in her 20s, moved out, fled to California to live with my brother in that area to get out of the craziness, ended up getting completely healthy, left her eating over days behind, got her first real job, got married, and now has two kids and just had a third. She has two older ones and just literally like just had a third baby. Her body wasn't supposed to be happy anymore. That wouldn't have happened if my mom was here. Just wouldn't have. The whole situation was not going to go that direction. My mom didn't have that personality to be able to push her out and help her get through stuff. And so my mom now, sitting in heaven, would look down and say, oh, this is so good. So good. Because she's looking from an eternal perspective. We were looking in the moment. My brother, who's six foot, almost six foot eleven, had to have back surgery and all these things because he's actually literally getting crippled from his body growing wrong and weird and just too tall, too fast and all those things. And um, what happened was that this lady was very on top of everything that helped my other sister just by being at odds with her and driving her into you know, the relationship just didn't work as a coddling relationship. But my brother was able to come in and say, hey, we're gonna help you. We're gonna get you on insurance. We're gonna get your back fixed. And she's tenacious very detailed person, and she got him in for surgery, got his back fixed, and he's actually studying right now to be a, a nurse at a hospital. He's in the middle of his courses right now. And so that would not have happened if my mom was alive. And I don't wish my mom to be dead, but those things would have never happened with her here. There's a lot of great, amazing, awesome things that happened with her here, but those would not have. And God's looking from an eternal perspective and saying, hey, this is going to hurt, this is going to be terrible, but our life here is short. And so this is going to happen, but it's going to happen for good. And in a little bit, we're all going to meet around the corner, and we're going to see how good this really turned out. And it's our ability to lift our eyes up off of the natural and see that God operates from a completely different level. And he sees from a completely different level. And it's that trust in him that allows us to live that way. But it says we're always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death works in us, but life in you. So God uses things in our life that are hard and difficult in order to bring something good out to bless and to serve others. Because as Christians, as followers of Christ, our life isn't just about us. Our life is about the people that God's put around us. 
Our destiny is secure. We know where we're going. We know that God's good. We know that God loves us. We know that we're going to heaven. And so God said, you know what? We've got that settled. Now I want you to go to work with me. And some of these things are going to be hard, but I'm going to use them so we can grow my family, so we can reach people. Let me sing out this verse. It says, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what's been written, I believe, and so I spoke. So just faith that believes. And I also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus. Let's talk about eternity. And bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends more and more, people may increase in thanksgiving to the glory of God. So God's using us to bring his glory into people's lives. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, we have difficult natural circumstances sometimes. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. Our heart and our spirit is still having life and growing and confidence and faith and joy, even though outside circumstances may not be the best at the moment. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And as we look not to the things that are seen, what's naturally happening, well, this is what's happening. Now, we don't look to that because that's temporary. It's in the moment. There's people in this room that, you know, a few months ago, it's like, I can't pay my house rent. It's impossible. We're going under. We're going to drown. We're going to go bankrupt. It's over. And then provision came. And they made the natural said no way. And yet they kept their eyes on the Lord and kept working and kept, you know, finding solutions and believing and God brought different things into their life and opportunities and helped pay that way. There's people relationally that are in this room I know people's stories, they're on the verge of divorce, separating from their spouse. There's no way to make this work. And yet, keeping their eyes not on what seems like reality, but on God's faithfulness, I've seen their marriage become restored. God started to use them in ministry. God started to use them to bless other people. And he's changing their life. There's people in this room that have gone through addiction. There's no way to break it. There's no way to change it. This can't happen. That's what's seen. You'll always be this way. And yet God has changed it and moved them forward and changed their life. And they're beginning to break away from that. And in the future, God's going to use them to see other people set free. So we don't look at our natural, we look at Jesus, what's unseen. For things that are seen, the end of this verse, things that are seen are transient, they move, they change. But the things that are unseen are eternal. The real reality isn't the reality that we see happening. The real reality in every circumstance that God is working for our good. It doesn't look good, it doesn't feel good, it can't be good. That's what we think in the natural. But what God's word is telling us is, no, that's not true. It is good. Well, how can it be good? Somebody died. How can it be good? This happened. No, it is good. I'm working for good. It's patience. It's waiting with me. I'm going to turn this around. If we can put our trust there, put our faith there, put our hope there, not in what we see, but in who God is, that he's faithful, that he loves us, that he cares for us, that he's going to come through, that in the end he's going to use us to bring him glory and we're going to enjoy that process and be a part of those things. Listening to Alicia, listening to Jason, other people, they go through that hard circumstance and yet there's so much joy and fulfillment being used by God to minister to the people around them that they're like, it's amazing. Even though it's hard. That's what God has for all of us. Just close our eyes and pray. I just want you to think about whatever your situation is that you're going through right now. You say, oh, this is hard. That exact situation is the one that God will use for you in your life and the life of others. Not just, well, when that situation is fixed, God can do good. No, that exact situation God can use for his glory. He can use it for good in your life. And he's going to do that. His word says he will do that. That he works all, meaning everything, together for his good. Father, we thank you for who you are, Lord. I pray that as people are, uh, Lord, just thinking for a moment, God, about an obstacle or challenge in their life, God, I pray that your spirit would bring peace into their heart and into their mind, God, to give them courage and faith, Lord, that you are with them, God, that you have good for them, or that this situation will turn, Lord, and that it will become something that they look back and say, man, God was at work. But Lord, I pray they would not have to wait until the outcome before they can experience it. Lord, your peace and thankfulness and joy, God, that you are with them. I pray, Lord, that they would have confidence and hope, God, that the waves and the storms would not toss them around and cause them to feel anxious or afraid or nervous or, God, uh, disappointed and discouraged. It would not 
as this scripture says, drive into despair. But Lord, that even in the storm, they would be able to find joy. Or they'd be able to find peace. Or they'd be able to trust you. That you are good. Lord, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.